there were three books that came out all in the same year, ironically, that talk about the same general concept, that every good idea is a combination of good ideas that came before it. There's the old metaphor of standing on the shoulders of giants, but you can think about it more specifically, almost like a mimetic analogy to genetics, meaning ideas are like genes, and they recombine in different and interesting ways, and that creates new ideas. So in history, there have been fascinating examples. I'm reading a variety of biographies of Nikola Tesla. And even just last night, yet another anecdote that the invention of radio, which has been hi highly contested as to who was the first. I grew up being told it was Marconi in Italy. And, and then recently, the US Supreme Court said, no, no, it was Nikola Tesla, you know, Serbian here in the United States. And now, I, I've been reading last night, there was a German and a British person who also invented radio all within months of each other. And the debate is just who filed their patent papers first. But literally within two to three months, four different continents, no sharing at that time, no internet at that time, the idea was ripe. It was time for the concept of radio to hit human consciousness. It was, if we are vessels of code, if we are vessels of genes, that's when the idea is combined in a very powerful way. Given the predecessors that came before, you had to understand a little bit about electricity and magnetism. They actually didn't understand much. Maxwell's equations were hotly debated at that point. They weren't even, you know, common, you know, curricula, let's say, if you were a doubly equivalent of the day. And so it's a fascinating thing that you have that. Now, the books that I'm about to show you all sort of just stop there at this point that, okay, every idea is a combination of new ideas. What I find interesting is that this might explain why you have technology accelerated change is that if you consider the set of ideas, so imagine the planet has a billion ideas, kind of a strange number, maybe it's a trillion, maybe it's a quadrillion, I don't know, some number n. As, the, as n grows, the number of groups you could form, possible pairwise or three-way combinations of a set, grows as something called Reed's Law. It's a two to the n sort of scaling law. It, it is the most powerful scaling law that I've ever seen anywhere close to a business phenomenon, meaning it, it, it dramatically outpaces things like network effects or Metcalfe's Law, which is, you know, if, if, if you sort of just look at how many um, uh, nodes there are in a social graph, it, it just sort of subgroup formation dominates all those in terms of scaling. You wouldn't, and you wouldn't notice it at small ends. It's kind of like, a, it's a weak phenomenon. It gets really powerful as the number of ideas grows. So if you think of the set of ideas growing, the possible permutations and recombinations grows exponentially just from a combinatorial explosion. And that, this economist, Brian Arthur of Santa Fe Institute argues that's what creates the economy. It's not that it's exogenous to the economy. This is what creates all economic growth in his opinion. Another writer, uh, founding uh, managing editor of Wired Magazine, Kevin Kelly, who I love, um, also points out that ideas or inventions are not just things like a light bulb or a radio. It's also sometimes a process invention. And his point is the scientific method, the concept of accumulating knowledge in a rigorous way with testable hypotheses and such. This is actually one of the biggest and most important inventions ever made. And it was almost a break point in humanity's capacity to accumulate and recombine ideas because good ideas tended to be in a sense culled and, or, or the bad ideas were culled and the good ideas uh, were recombined a bit more often than, than ideas that were, were shown to be less powerful in terms of their explan explanatory power. And then lastly, you gotta turn to the British for a uh, easy to remember version of the same argument. Um, something you could always remember at a cocktail party, which is uh, this idea of ideas getting together and mating. So in simple uh, uh, redux, ideas having sex. That is what it's all about. And that is hard to forget once you have that idea in your head. And there's some interesting side effects of all this, which is it explains partially this peculiar phenomenon that, um, in urban world uh, development that people are more inventive when they live in cities. The inventions per capita, inventions per person, goes up in a city. So if you have a million people living in a city, they will invent more stuff than a million people living in the countryside or living in suburbia. And it's intriguing because you could imagine the cafe of the mind, the cross-pollination ideas, people getting together, kind of like this mean plex of modernity, this, this ability to, to be the pollinating vessels of ideas. If Again, if we're just vessels of ideas, um, it makes sense that that might happen, and that's good news because we, you know, we just crossed the 50% point and there are going to be 500 new cities the size of New York built in the 50, next 50 years. Or every existing city will have to take three times as many people as it currently has, which means about four to five times as much footprint, which is impossible for current cities. It also explains the power of interdisciplinary disruption. This is something we notice in universities. You may have felt it if any of you were in a science or engineering field at a university or interfacing with people who were. This is where interesting cross-pollination of ideas occurs. And if you imagine the segregation of ideas, their, their sort of divergence into systems uh, or disciplines, and they have all their systems vernacular, and people don't talk 
between each other. Those are pools of ideas that were separated from one another. And then if you're the student that can process between them, wow, that's where really amazing breakthroughs come through from. Um, there's so many classic examples in history from the deciphering of DNA structure to others where it's someone from outside the field who makes the meaningful breakthroughs, often. Uh, not a chemist thinking about chemistry, but let's say a geneticist and a computer scientist and an information theorist coming at a problem, combining ideas in new interesting ways.